Welcome to the Jupiter Portable Magnifier Strategies and Features, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Jim. Thanks, Leanne, and good morning, everyone. We are so grateful that you can join us on this Friday. I hope you guys are getting ready for a great weekend. And so as we get going with this webinar, as it is Friday, we like to start with a fun question. So if you are vacationing this summer, where would you be vacationing? Perhaps you are, or perhaps you are not. Would you be off to the beach to sit in the sand? Maybe to the lake to do a little fishing or boating? to the mountains to do some camping or some hiking, or maybe you'd prefer to go to the big city to do a little sightseeing. Uh, there's something else you prefer to do, throw that in the chat. So we'll see what your results are here momentarily, and then we'll get started. And Leanne will bring us those results here momentarily. So it looks like That's the okay. beach is weighing in. Oh, well, Pensacola is saying hi, and we're hearing, Monhawk Mountain Hotel in New York, going to Florida, going sailing, going on a mission trip. Nice. Visiting grandchildren, and it doesn't matter where they are. Going to Wisconsin. So I'm going to end the poll. Let's see where a majority of us want to go vacation. 48% to the beach. Come join me in Florida. 27% in the mountains, 15 at the lake seven and other and that was the bunch that we were reading and then three are going to that big city excellent we, we appreciate your participation in that we like to have a little bit of fun as we get started so for our agenda today for the next 60 minutes we're going to do introductions we'll talk about the objectives and then we're going to introduce the cat program out of talladega alabama and then we'll get into talking about the Jupiter portable magnifier, the different camera modes, the controls, and the questions. And again, this is a great opportunity for all of us to learn a little bit more about the CAT program and some of the folks that are involved with that down in Talladega. So momentarily, I'll introduce that team. But before I do that, let's talk a little bit about the objectives. So our objectives for today you, the participant, will learn how to use the three different camera modes on the Jupiter Portable Magnifier. You're going to get the opportunity to learn about the seven function buttons on the front of the device, and then you will also learn how to use the hotkeys and features. And sprinkled all throughout that will be specific learning solutions, excuse me, uh, specific tasks that you can complete with the uh, with the Jupiter and so um, with that then uh, before we kind of jump into that just a reminder that uh, next week we will be doing three of these webinars and on Wednesday specifically we'll be doing something on the <laughs> functional skills assessment that'll be Wednesday June 17th from 12 p.m. to 1 30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, Laura Zier of our APH, uh, Kevin Hollinger of SOAR, and then Eric Shaw of the Vermont uh, Bureau for Persons with Visual Impairments will be joining us for that. And I think we'll throw a link to that registration in the chat. So don't forget that this summer we're continuing on with this at home webinar series. All right, so uh, joining us today and our presenter is Dr. Susie Thomas. She is with uh, the Alabama Institute for Deaf and Blind, and she is one of their assistive technology trainers and specialists. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Susie now. Susie has a, a BS, BS in secondary biology and English. She's got an MS in special ed and VI. She has her doctorate in instructional leadership. She's been teaching for some 22 odd years, 15 of which specifically are with uh, students who are visually impaired and blind. She's a certified TVI, a certified O&M, and a certified transcriber. So she's been awfully busy and we are delighted that she can be with us today to tell us a little bit more about the Jupiter. Uh, you're in for a treat. Uh, we've been doing a little practicing with Susie and some of the stuff that she'll bring to you. I think you'll really appreciate. Now, uh, joining us a little bit later on in the summer will be Jill Dunaway. She's also a member of the AIDB team. Uh, she is an assistive technology trainer and specialist. And a little bit later on in July, she's going to do a presentation for us on the Braille Trail Reader. And then also joining us today is Dennis Gillum. Uh, Dennis is also with AIDB. 
Uh, he works with special ed testing, outreach, and special projects with the organization. And now, uh, Dennis is going to tell us a little bit about uh, CAT, the Center for Assistive Technology and Training out of Talladega. Dennis, you're on. Hey, hey awesome. awesome. Can, can you hear me? me? I can hear you. All right. I just, just want to make sure. sure. Now, I, I hear an echo. echo. Hopefully, Hopefully you don't, don't hear anything, do you? We hear an echo. We hear a little bit oh, of an echo. Gruesome. Sorry. Let me. You have two mics on, which is why. Let's try that. That's better. Is this better? Yeah, it's better. All right. You got it. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jim. So the Center of Assistive Technology Training is a partnership that was developed between the American Printing House for the Blind and the Alabama Institute for Deaf and Blind. It is a federally funded program. So two years ago, we spoke with some folks in the Senate and on the House side and said that we really have a need for developing assistive technology training in the K-12 programs, but more along the lines of when you produce and put devices in students' hands, we don't always have the training that is accessible and available to all those students. So what we wanted to do is to make sure that not only those students and TVIs and parents had an opportunity to get devices and get the training, but all of that came to them at no cost to them. And we also see that a lot of times in the school systems and in other parts of our educational environments, that a lot of these devices, the wonderful things that are produced through APH, are oftentimes kept at schools because there might just be one device, or they, there are shared devices or, or devices that are shared from home and school. So this is an opportunity for students and TVIs to place these devices in hands of students without worrying about, hey, this one has to be tagged to stay at the local um, school environment and it's tied down to one teacher. Um, we do serve nine states and those uh, are abbreviated on the slide there that Jim's got up, which is Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, Louisiana, Tennessee, Kentucky, North Carolina, and South Carolina. Our goal is to provide training and to provide devices as well to blind and low vision students across the Southeast and to TVIs. Now we do see that there's going to be a, uh, a bit of an expansion going throughout. We don't know exactly what that is because there is a bit of a mess uh, going on with um, some things in politics and I won't get on either side of the aisle, but I will tell you that that has slowed our progress just a little bit as far as expansion, but we are still very motivated and, and very interested in continuing on the great work that is going on with APH and now with the Center for Assistive Technology Training. We are based here in Talladega, Alabama, as Jim said, but that does not mean that we are bound by the borders of not only this county or the state. So we do offer up trainings. There are going to be several that are offered in the Southeast as soon as the COVID-19 regulations are decreased. There will be some CBI workshops, some CBI trainings, some device trainings, and all of those, uh, we do our best to make sure that that comes at no cost to you or your system. So if you need a little bit more information about the Center for Assistive Technology training, uh, there is an email at the bottom of the screen there. And if you don't have access to that, it's C-A-T-T -T at A-I-D-B dot org. And with that, I don't want to take any more of Susie's time. So Susie Thomas is one of our trainers that we have we've got going out into the systems and we are so excited that she can provide one of these trainings. We look forward to some other ones that we could provide as well. Thanks, Dennis. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. I just want y'all to know I'm a little nervous. I've never done a webinar before, so we're going to move the camera around and get started. And while she is moving that camera around, I wanted to ask you, um, we are curious, is your school or university currently using a learning management system? If so, what LMS are you using? And you can choose multiple. We know many of you work in multiple locations where you might actually be having to yourselves learn multiple learning management systems and access for you or your students in those. If we missed one and Jim did a good job searching. Uh, please feel free to put it in the chat. We'd like to know uh, because we, our goal is to make sure that you have the tools so that you can have your students have access to all of these as much as possible. So this helps us build things to help you help your students. 
I'm gonna wait one more second. I will end the poll. They're still coming in, so I'm waiting a second. Okay, and what is interesting is we have 60% uh, are saying Google Classroom. So that is like winning over all of the others by quite a bit. So thank you so much, Susie, take it away. Thank you so much. All right, we're gonna get started. Uh, first thing I'm gonna talk about is how to charge. It usually lasts about five hours. So I get my students to charge at the end of the day and maybe at lunchtime. Right here at the back. Now I like to put white out here you can put like a, a, a sticker or something that makes a good contrast there to help your students see where it plugs in. It's very simple. It plugs in there and it'll charge. And then it has, like I said, about five hours of battery life for them to use. Now it's, it is considered portable, but it's a little heavy. So your smaller students, um, I know some school systems that I have worked in, they start changing classes at like third grade. You can put it on a rolling cart or a rolling desk. Just make sure that you strap it down um, because it is gonna be a little hard for students. Uh, yes, we could have a para carry it, but we try to you know, increase their independence by getting them totally independent in carrying their equipment. All right, first thing we're gonna look at is setting it up. It's a little hard to set up. You, the book tells you to pull here we have noticed that there are some issues with the wiring. So I always try to teach my students to pull either on the left or the right, and we pull it up and you have to hold the tray down and you have to pull. Again, for smaller students, that's kind of hard. They may need some help until they can build up that muscle strength. Then the screen will tilt out. It can go all the way up, it can go down, it can tilt forward or back. And that's great for your smaller students or if you have a really tall student, they can adjust it for them. All right, we're gonna get started here going over all of the buttons at the bottom. We're gonna start on the left-hand side. The left-hand side, the first button is the power button. So we just push that and it takes a couple of seconds to turn on. And you may have to adjust the camera. The camera is located at the top of the screen to the back. It has a knob on the right hand side that will move the camera up and down. Um, if you're looking at something under your screen here, make sure the extra lens is closed that's located on the front of the camera. We're going to start off by looking at just this picture just to show some things that we can do with it. The second button, it lightens or darkens it. If you have someone that is photophobic, they may like it on a one. Some other students may like it a little brighter and you can get it up to a five. The third button from the left is the camera button. It's easy, you press it, it takes a picture. Now the student can move that and it can be magnified. If you need to go back to a live picture, the student will press the camera button again and it goes back to the live picture. The fourth button from the left is your magnification button. You turn it to the right, it magnifies it. If it turn, you turn it to the left, it gets smaller. The fourth button from the left, excuse me, the fifth button from the left or the third from the right is the contrast button. It will change the contrast and I'm gonna show you in a little bit how you can give them more options for the contrast colors, but they can choose. The next button is the second from the right. It carries it back to the natural picture. If they get into here and they really don't like it and they wanna go back out instead of flipping like that, they can press the natural color button and it goes back to the natural color. And the last button is the first one from the right or the seventh one from the left is your toggle switch. So if I magna, uh, take a picture and magnify it, it will move it left and right, up and down. Now let's go into some special features. If you look at the magnification button, if you press the magnification button and hold it, you'll notice that a menu comes up. You have five 
things on the menu. You have the color mode, the power saving mode, zoom ratio, LED brightness, and you can reset to the factory setting. We're going to go into the color mode. This is where you're going to add some different contrast colors for your student. Now, I don't normally show my students all of this because some, especially younger students, may want to play with it and they're playing with this instead of doing their work. But you know your students, um, you know which ones you can trust to show them this. So once you get in here, you press it again and it goes in and you see it has a whole lot of different contrast. If you'll notice, all of these that are outlined in red, these are the choices that I've already made. It comes with the top row and I've added this one. Now to add one, I just use my magnification button and turn it left or right and I carry it to the colors that I want and then I just press it. If you noticed, there's a red outline that comes up and now that will be in my contrast menu. Then I have to go down all the way to the bottom and go to save. I have to highlight save, it's highlighted in yellow. I press the middle and it saves it. Now those colors are included in my contrast. Okay. All right, we're gonna go back to the menu again. I'm gonna press the magnification button. Now I'm gonna go from color mode to power saving mode. I turn my magnification button to power saving and then I'm going to press it and it opens that. It is set to go off, the light goes off in 10 minutes and then it powers off in three minutes. You can also extend that time to 20, minutes before the light goes off, five minutes before it cuts off, 30 minutes or 10 minutes, or you can just not use it at all. I like to use the original 10 minutes and three minutes because that seems to, to work for my students. Again, if you've got a student who may work a little bit and forget to power it down, just to save battery life, you may wanna set it on this. Okay, to get out of that, I'm gonna press it again takes me back out to the main menu. I can go down to the zoom ratio and change the, the ratio that it zooms in. You know what's best for your student. You can try the different ratios while you're working with your student to see which one works best for them. Press it again, I go all the way out to my menu and then I can do the LED brightness. Hold the button. I like it on the, the brightest it can be, but you can adjust that, especially someone who has uh, photophobia. You may want to, to change that. Even students that don't have photophobia, it may work better for them if you have the LED light set at a lower uh, ratio. I like it bright. Then I'm going to go back out. There we go. All right, so we have our contrast button again, and I wanted to show you those extra colors that are added again. Um, again, this is up to your student, what your student can use. Uh, you may want to pull that menu up, go through it with them, but not really show them how to use it because again, it can become a toy instead of a uh, useful tool. Um, I went back to the natural picture. Another thing I'd like to show you is how you can get your reading guides. On the toggle switch, which is the very last button from the left or the first button from the right, we're gonna press in. Now, sometimes if you don't press directly on the center, it doesn't bring it up. So it just takes practice. You noticed my, my line came up. If I want to change the type of line I have, I just go left and right, and it changes the position and changes the type of line I have. If I want to make it wider or thinner, I can use the up on the toggle switch or the down on the toggle switch. If I wanna go back to the regular um, screen without the line, I press here. Now, something I use for my smaller students that are a little short, 
sometimes I just have them use the bottom of the screen as their reading line. Like that. Um, it works for them so that they don't have to look up to, to the middle of the screen, especially if they're, you know, little like kindergarten, pre-K. But if I want to use it, I like the black line, but again, it's according to what your student likes. So they may like the, the, the um, put out or they may like the line. I like the line. Um, some may do it like that because they can read it better. It cuts out on the clutter. When you do something like this, you have to teach your student how to move the book or the paper that's under here. That's a skill that needs to be learned, so they may not understand how to do it, but you can take time and you can teach them how to do it. I know I'm speaking a lot about students. This is great for adults as well, but my experience is in the K-12 classroom, so that's where um, my suggestions come from, but these can also be applied to adult learners as well. There's that, the cutout, and if you wanna make it bigger, Like that. Again, it's according to what your student can use. Like that. They can get more information into their cutout. Okay. All right. Now we're going to look at some things in the distance view. The camera is located above the screen in the back. The camera has an extra lens right here that is for near viewing only. So when the student starts to view something in the distance, they'll have to open that up. It's to the top when it's facing me, but there they'll just flip it to the bottom. And they, there is a knob on the right hand side that will move the camera. And we're gonna focus in on a eye chart. I'm not in a classroom as you can tell. Um, COVID-19 has got us all messed up, but we're gonna look at the chart and I'm gonna make sure that the extra lens is down. It'll take it a second or two and it'll focus in. You can then use your magnification button. If you notice, I still have my reading line got up. You want that off? Just go back and press that. I can enlarge this to see. I can also take a picture of this. So I can use my third button from the left and take a picture and now it is on my screen as you can see i can move my machine and it's on the screen now it will not toggle if the image has not been enlarged but if you enlarge the image the student can then toggle left and right and everything that's in that picture can be seen even if they have to magnify it if you'll notice on the side here these are blurry Sometimes if something's really small and they take a picture of it and they try to read it, it's not going to show up. So the student may have to move closer, take their machine closer to the image being taken. And that is all according to what your student may need. Um, again, smaller students may need some help or it needs to be on a rolling cart so they can move it to where they can see. We really want to move to independence. So if you can make it uh, accessible to them so that they can move it and they can be independent on the use, that's great. All right, I want to go back to a natural picture. I'm going to press my camera button, which is the third button from the left, and I go back to the natural picture, as you can see. Say that I want to focus in on something and I'm, I'm not quite sure what. You may have to move this to see they can move it um something that we're going to try uh, we have ordered um like a laptop swivel top that we're going to try on this i can't say that that's going to work but that's just an idea that we're going to try to help with the student moving this especially a smaller student that may have to move it it can be a little heavy so you just work out something that's going to work for your student
Now we're going to look at some near um, things that we could do on our camera. So I'm going to close my second lens. I'm going to turn the camera back down to my, my tray and we're going to look here. This can be used for coloring. Um, this is a skill that has to be learned. It's not as, uh, as easy as, as you may think because you're not looking at the picture itself. You're actually looking at the screen. So it's going to take time. Some things that I like to do with my students is I have them point at the object. If they can kind of see the outline, they can point at the object and then move it up to where the screen shows it. And it makes it a little easier for them to color. Um, sorry. Even your high school students can, sometimes they get, they may have worksheets that are not of the greatest quality. So if the teacher tries to enlarge it, it gets really grainy and it's not good uh, visually. So the students can still use regular size um, pictures or worksheets and they can use the machine to answer it. The camera can move so that I can see the questions. I can answer the questions. Um, like how does the shape of the plant cell different from that of the animal cell? Then I can write. I like to tilt my paper because to me that's easier. Some kids like to write up and down. Again, it's what your student needs and you just help them. And you can put that um, the animal cell is round. And that's in cursive and a lot of people don't read cursive, so I apologize. Um, but that's just something, again, what your student prefers if they want to learn to write with their paper slanted or if they want to learn uh, with their paper straight. There, I wanted to show you the difference in the way uh, lined paper looks on here. This is regular paper, has the blue lines that you can get. And then here's the bold line paper that you can get from APH. It's a big difference. Um, I like the bold line paper. Unfortunately, a lot of our students, as they get older, they don't want to be different. So they may want to use the regular paper and you can still use that. It shows up very well for them to, to learn to write or to write their answers on here. Um, it just takes time and practice. Sometimes the student may want or have to have a notebook. If the camera is turned down and they try to push it up and they can't get the bottom of their notebook, they can move the camera so that they can get to the bottom of the notebook. Don't think that just because something doesn't fit that they'd have to fold it or take it out of the notebook. The camera will move and you can see the entire notebook and they can use the entire notebook. Now, if they slant it, of course the picture's gonna be slanted and they'll have to move their notebook or their paper so that they can see where they're writing or where they're reading. APH also has these bold line notebooks that you can get. And it's the same, You, if the camera is straight down, it's not gonna get the whole notebook, but you can move the camera so that the entire notebook comes into focus. As you can see, this is as small as the picture gets and I can't get everything on that notebook. So the student will have to be taught how to move the paper left and right to keep it straight. You can use the reading guide. To help them with their reading and then they just move it right across there. Or like I do with my younger kids, I just teach them to use the bottom part of the screen and they use that as they move it across. 
And let's look at a book to show better. The student may have to enlarge it, but they can use the bottom of the screen and learn to move it because a lot of your students, they want to move it too fast. They'll move it and they don't uh, remember where their place is. This is a skill that's going to have to be learned. So be patient with your student. I can use my reading guide. My reading guide can go up and down. Um, excuse me, it can be narrow or wide and then it can go up and down. I can move it up and down by moving my toggle switch. Now, some of your older children may can work this um, and it may work for them to do that. Some of your youngest students may, may not understand how to do that. Again, it's according to your student's needs and your student's ability. Contrast also works when I'm using my reading guide. I just wanted to just see that the contrast does work with that. I'm going to go back to a whole paper. Um, something that, and this is a book, it's not a great quality, but unfortunately some of our students have books that are older and the quality of the pictures are not great. The quality of the words, as you can see, this is kind of yellowed. You can see the picture uh, on the back of the page but this machine still works very well in helping them to, uh, to be able to uh, have access to this. Something I wanted to show you, a feature, is I'm looking at this young lady right here. I want to see what she has in her hand. Oops, sorry. Take the contrast button. And you can change the contrast. Um, again, a student may like, let's say, they like yellow on black, but a picture like this, it doesn't show very well. So teaching them to change the contrast to see it better is a great skill the student needs to have. And then I can go back to normal picture. If I want to focus in on this right here, I can magnify it. But as you can see, it's not a great quality picture. And so it becomes pixelated when the student enlarges it. This is something that we can't help. Um, students have to learn um, that not all pictures are going to be great quality, but you can teach them the skills to, to see it the best that they can see. Something else, when a student is coloring, um, sometimes kids uh, may not know their colors or they may want to know exactly what color they're, they're looking at. If they're reading a crayon, it cannot be brought up to the camera. If you can see, it's very blurry. But if they lay it down, it becomes clear and they can magnify that so that they can read it better. So that's something uh, that you, uh, a skill that you may want to teach your younger children. Something I wanted to bring out also was sometimes our students, one of the accommodations that they get is that they get a copy of notes. So another student in the classroom has taken notes. Um, and this, I wanted to show you how different um, types of ink or pencils show up. We've got um, black ink. This is actually blue ink. This is the Vizavi marker that you can get from APH, and this is a pencil. And this is the original copy. Now I've copied that, and as you can tell, the pencil did not show up very well, but the ink and the Vizavi did. So this is just a suggestion, especially for your older students. If you have someone taking notes for your student, 
pen is going to copy better and it's going to show up on the machine better. Um, something that your younger students may need to learn to do is to cut paper. Uh, a lot of our students, if they cut paper, they'd have to get uh, very close, even dangerously close and get the scissors near their eyes. This too is a, an acquired skill, but the student can learn to cut. What I do is I teach my students to point as where their scissors are going to start. And then they can use the machine to cut their paper. Now I'm sitting back probably 12 inches from the screen and I'm able to see the line and stay on the line and I'm getting those fine motor skills. This is something we can teach our students. Again, this is an acquired skill. Um, it's a lot harder for them because they are used to, they come to school used to using their eyes for everything and they are using their eyes, but we're adding this piece of assistive technology that's gonna help them um, and it's gonna take time. So when you have time to work with your student, you're not just teaching them what the buttons mean and what the extra buttons mean. You're teaching them skills that they have to learn to use the equipment to get all they can get out of it. Um, do I have any questions? Oh, you've got questions, Susie. Uh-oh. There's, there's, there's all kinds of questions. Tell you what, okay. why, don't we do, uh, why don't we do one of our polls? Uh, Mike Wood has joined us and has been helping to answer some polls. So, all right. So, all right. So, are you and or your students able to access the learning management systems that you are using? So, we've got yes, we've got no. And then I've thrown in the sort of, meaning we can get to most of it, but we can't necessarily get to all of it, right? So if there's a barrier, feel free to throw that barrier to the learning management system in the chat. So we will let you guys respond. We'll have Leanne do a summary of those responses. And then Susie, we need to identify maybe what questions are, are sitting out there. I know someone had asked the question about the distance between the, um, that you have for writing. So once we've complete the, the poll, maybe you can talk a little bit about that distance between the monitor and the, uh, and the plate or the reading table for, for writing. So. And Mike just Leanne? put that also in the chat. The entire unit dimensions are approximately 13 by 15 by 17. When folded, it's 13 by 15 by two. Uh, so ending our poll, 35% said yes, their students are able to access 22 no and then we've got 43 that sort of and and not sure if we can uh, help but we will continue to do what we can to help on APH's end to get you uh, access for your students. Oh, I, I love this one the most recent one how robust is the construction i.e. can it survive being dropped. <laughs> I always like to like describe this as the will it pass the fall off the pickup truck test. Um, <laughs> Probably not, uh, but it is really well constructed. So I don't know, Susie, do you want to comment on the construction of the, the Jupiter? Well, fortunately, I've never had a student knock it off or drop it, um, but it is, um, has a lot of plastic construction um, on, and the camera, like I said, pulling on where the camera is, which is um, not good for the camera wires. We've had some issues with that. I don't think that it would um, survive being dropped or knocked off, but it has a good enough weight to it that it, if it's sitting on the desk correctly and somebody bumps into the desk or bumps into the machine, it should not fall off. The danger comes with, with the student transporting it. It does come with uh, a carrying case um, that the students can use. Um, I don't know if this is going to show up, but it, it it slips down into this carrying case. The student can carry it uh, hugged in their arms. Um, a lot of times, however, students don't use the case because the teachers are changing class and they don't want to take the time, but they can fold it um, and carry it um, pretty well. Um, 
if you have a student um, that's um, very active, you may want to remind them to be very careful when they carry it. Um, because like with any piece of technology, if it drops, it, there's a good chance that something's gonna go wrong. I don't see any other, there, there's some questions that are out there about comparing and contrasting the device uh, to some of the other solutions that are out there and we can, we can tackle that uh, at, a, at another time, but do you see any other questions that are out there for, for Susie at this time that we haven't captured? So yeah. Susie, you showed us that uh, you can adjust the time and amount for the device to stay on. Uh, yes. Is there anything else about how the device would know that you're still working for those students that might be spending a long period of time with, with um, material underneath? Um, that, I've not had an issue with it cutting off, but usually the student is fooling with the knobs and um, as long as the knobs are being used, it has not cut off on me. Um, but if the student's reading like a novel, uh, you may want to set it to a, um, a higher time or just not use it at all. And you can go in to the uh, power saving mode. Again, you press the magnification button. It comes up to the menu. You go to power saving mode, press the, um, the magnification button again, and then you can highlight it. If you notice it's highlighted in red, I can choose not to use it. And then I can go down and not use it for power off as well. And now I have no timer set on it. So if it's a student that's reading a novel, then it, this would probably be the best way to use it. Okay, thanks. And I think that highlighting that piece, I think really definitely answered the question about, about that piece. Um, there is no OCR function with this one. I wanted to verbally um, um, confirm that for folks that might have been on the phone and not um, seeing the information coming in the chat itself. It is a device that's available on federal quota. So this is a device that is out there and made ready for our students and our teachers who are utilizing federal quota dollars. You do not have to use federal quota dollars, but it is available on federal quota dollars to be able to and these um, and this is also if you're in one of the states that the cap program is operating in this is a piece of equipment that we can provide for you as well as training okay um, and you can keep it plugged in and not use the battery if you choose to or you can choose to charge and then uh, use it without that plug And I'm sorry, I'm flipping through. Someone had asked a question about the markers and I was looking for it in the magazine so I could give you the, um, the number. So that's why I'm flipping through pages. I'm not trying to be rude, sorry. <laughs> well, it's some of the other things that you might wanna know about the Jupiter is that uh, it has uh, pluses and minuses when you're talking about the different options. And so assistive technology evaluations and assessments are definitely something that you might wanna consider when making um, choices for your students. So that is something to think about. Uh, there's a question to know if the Jupiter can be attached to a computer. Mike, can you answer that one? I don't believe, I don't believe that you can use the Jupiter as a screen for your computer and then mm -hmm. toggle back and forth if that's the, so. the, the basics of the question. So sometimes a uh, screen such as the Jupiter can be used for two purposes. One would be for your computer screen and then you can toggle and use as, a, um, as the screen for your video magnifier. It does not have that capability. Yeah, and to answer that as well, you would need a video capture card, which is an optional uh, purchase. I purchased one on Amazon for, I believe, $199. And then what it allowed me to do was connect the HDMI to the video capture card and then connect that to my laptop. And then on your laptop, you're able to have a split screen where you're able to view what the Jupiter is looking at and then maybe be using Zoom text. Um, to magnify you know, your computer screen. So you can use your computer screen and what the Jupiter is looking at, but you can't do it the opposite way. And that requires an additional component, the video capture card.
we have some questions also about markers. I know that a majority of Visa V markers are sold at places like Office Depot or Walmart uh, um, stores such as that. That isn't something that we carry at APH because it's something that you can buy um, commercially. Um, it's not something special for students with visual impairments, which is what APH's focus is. Trying to see if there's any other questions we didn't answer. Um, Mike, are there different models of the Jupiter that someone might get confused with if they purchased something outside of APH? Uh, the only things that similar to the Jupiter are some uh, mainstream products that we have, such as the uh, Merlin Mini or the Topaz Ultra, but the screen size is different. So the Jupiter is a 13 inch screen and it's a similar style to the Jupiter, but there are 15 inch and 17 inch screens. So they're larger screens, but um, Okay, that's that's good because sometimes people aren't quite sure if they've gotten something on quota or not. So that exactly. helps them out. Yes, yep. yes. And none of those have OCR built into them. They're just a, a down and dirty, uh, you know, magnifier with the uh, features that Susie's been showing. Okay, okay. Um, does the Jupiter work when you're placing a, a digital device underneath, such as an iPad or a tablet? Yeah, I've used it. I've had some people uh, use it for that, you know, to look at photos on their iPhone or whatnot, and it, it will zoom in. You may have to lower the light uh, underneath the Jupiter for screen glare or something like that, but it will definitely work. Okay. And for those that need to know what OCR stands for, that's optical character recognition. And it's the ability to turn a picture roughly into print. And, and many people for students with visual impairments will then use that turn into print to be able to use some type of voiceover um, capability to be able to understand that print at the same time. I noticed that someone asked about motion. I don't know if this is what they were um, referring to. But I, my students do use the distance camera to watch a teacher write on the board um, or to see demonstrations. They can, this can be used for that. Um, I hope that answers that question. Okay, I'm going to give you a few minutes to um, think of more questions that you want answered. And while you're doing that, I'm going to ask you your opinion. In your opinion, what is the greatest benefit of an accessible learning management system to students with visual impairments? What is the greatest benefit? That doesn't mean that these aren't all benefits, but what do you think is the greatest benefit? Is it the communication with teachers and fellow students? Is it the access to their course materials? Is it access to their course progress, such as grades? Um, or is it other? Did we not think of one? So again, uh, what in your opinion is the greatest benefit of an accessible learning management system? And if, if I didn't think of it, you are welcome to put it in the chat for your other. So let's see what people told us. Access to course materials is winning over all 83% with 16% communication to teachers. Um, and then there's a little bit of other, which I saw things such as leveling the playing field. So that, that is something that we can definitely see as, as helpful for them. Um, will, uh, will, with close work, will Jupiter also show motion like on an iPad and Google Meet? So meaning if you were putting a digital device underneath, will it allow the motion on the iPad to, would, would, you, would you be able to see that motion? I don't think I've ever tried that. Uh, Susie, if you have something like a YouTube video, do you have an iPhone or an iPad near you that you may be able to try I that? Am, with? I am, and I'm actually pulling it up right now. <laughs> Thanks, Susie, and good to meet you, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. So another other was that the virtual classroom recently so strong is allowing students and teachers to have equal access, which we can definitely see. 
<laughs> okay, so, so Susie yes. has the placed choice, Susie. the TV or her phone underneath the Jupiter's camera. Um, one of the things that you could definitely see is a little bit of that light glare. So you would want to play around with your lights um, underneath the Jupiter and turn it down so that the light yeah. was um, uh, not reflecting off of the glass screen of the phone. So you uh, have the ability to adjust that glare. So Susie's going to click the button and she's going to work on adjusting the lighting. And that's that's at low, so they may have to move it so that so they can see. If you press and hold the center button, Susie, you'll be able to get into the menu and then you can change the LED. So go down to the LED brightness. Yeah. And then click that all the way down to the left. Uh, twist it again. I'm sorry. Twist that knob as if you were magnifying to the left and it will. Oh, there we go. I don't think we dim them enough. And twist it all the way to the left once you get in there. Yeah. And then turn it to the left like you're zooming up once you're on the LED brightness. Just like, yep, no. Turn that knob, nope. Don't press it, uh, go down again to LED brightness. And yep, click it once. And then turn the knob like you, yeah, there you go, there you go. And then uh, you can press and hold to get out of there. Press and hold to get out of there. And now maybe zoom in a little because the lights are off now. So I'm not sure where you're getting a glare from at all. Yep. So again, doable, it has its pluses yeah. and minuses to it, um, but it's something that it looks like if you play around a little, um, and we know our students, they tend to pick up things that we would never think of them picking up. Did you see any more questions in there, Jim? No, I mean, other than the question that someone asked about uh, raising the topic of accessible learning management systems. Obviously, you know, this is something we could go on for a while, but it was one of the reasons why I put that question out there because those LMSs are becoming such a fabric of the, the K-12 educational institutions. And there are so many advantages of them. When they are not accessible, it is a train wreck. When they are accessible, the opportunities are endless. So it is something that I wanted to just get a little bit of a feel for and it's something that we'll be uh, asking some questions about to see if maybe we can bring some discussion about that to this forum uh, sometime down the road. So we appreciate your participation in that. Uh, to the question specifically about differences between say the Mat Connect and the Jupiter, the Mat Connect is a smart device. So one of the elements of it is you can bring applications to it. It has the distance and the near, as well as the optical character recognition, whereas something like the Jupiter, uh, uh, has those three viewing modes so you have the distance self and near and is uh, a little bit uh, simpler in some ways in its in its operation so as Leanne pointed out doing an assistive technology evaluation uh, when you can uh, with your students to determine you know what is the best fit is always advisable so I guess I will ask Susie if there is anything else that she would like to share before I share my screen for one last time. Uh, up on the screen, I just have my contact information. If you have any questions, um, and if you are in the state of Alabama and you need help, um, please feel free to contact me. We are gonna have some uh, more workshops that are based in Alabama, um, and we're moving out. We've got one in Louisiana and one in Florida planned, so if you, need information on that, please feel free to contact me. Super. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and share, share my screen. And, and as I do that, I really wanna give a big shout out to the folks in Talladega for collaborating with us on this. This is the first of what we hope are going to be a number of webinars that we can do in conjunction. And you could see, as I said from the outset, that you are going to see some insight into using the device. And that's exactly what Leanne and I saw a few weeks back. So Susie, outstanding job. Thank you, Mike, 
thanks for jumping in to assist as well. So as we wrap up, before we throw that code at you, just a reminder that the Jupiter is available on quota or without quota, the cost is $3,200. And the uh, Video Mag HD is also available as a low vision solution uh, on quota. Uh, it can, of course, be purchased without quota funds, and that's $499. And so with that, one final thanks to our, our co-host today, and I'll leave it to Leanne to, to wrap it up. Thank you all for joining us today. It was great having all of you, and thank you to the Center for Assistive Technology and Training, the CAT team, for a wonderful webinar.